Howdy. This is the second video for energy of atomic orbitals. To understand atoms, molecules, and chemical reactions, we have to understand how electrons are distributed in atoms, molecules, and their relative energy. The difference in how elements actually behave is due to their different electron configurations, which atomic orbitals are actually filled. And so atomic orbitals are fairly important. After watching this video, you should understand that the energy of electron orbitals is mainly due to electrostatic interaction between the electron and nucleus. You should understand that the electrostatic interaction depends on the distance between the electron and the nucleus and the amount of shielding. You should understand that the lower the energy, the more stable, and the more stable orbitals are filled first. And you should understand that the order the orbitals are filled and how this is related to the periodic table. And so electrons fill the lowest energy orbitals first and fill orbitals following Pauli exclusion principle and Hund's rule. And so you should remember that an orbital is characterized by a unique set of three quantum numbers N, L, and M sub L. An electron is characterized by a unique set of four quantum numbers N, L, M sub L, and M sub S. And M sub S can have values of plus a half or minus a half. Because M sub S has, has two possible values, that's why you can have a maximum of two electrons per orbital. Hund's rule says that if you have orbitals that have the same energy, then give them their own orbital as long as possible. The energy of orbitals depends on electrostatic interaction between electron and nucleus. The larger the effective nuclear charge, the stronger the electrostatic interaction, and the lower the energy of the orbital. The closer the electron to the nucleus, the stronger electrostatic attraction, and the lower the energy of the orbital. The lower the energy of the orbital, the more stable. And so we can actually summarize some of this in this schematic. And so again, an orbital is characterized by three quantum numbers, N, L, and M sub L. N is the principal quantum number. It denotes the shell and indicates the size. And so the smaller the n, the smaller the size, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the stronger electrostatic attraction between electron and nucleus. On the other hand, we have the larger the effective nuclear charge, the stronger the attraction. Now, the effective nuclear charge depends on the number of protons in the nucleus, also depends on shielding. And so less shielding, larger effective nuclear charge, stronger attraction, stronger attraction, lower the energy of the orbital, the more stable the orbital. So two basic considerations, how close the electrons are to the nucleus and what is the effective nuclear charge. And using these two ideas, we can actually get this energy level diagram. And again, the 1s orbital is the lowest energy orbital because it's the closest to the nucleus. And so the smaller the n, the closer the electrons to the nucleus, the more stable the orbital. And because of shielding, in a shell, the S is less shielded than the P, which is less shielded than D. For in a shell, the S is going to be lower in energy than the P and the D. And so this energy level diagram is just due to those two things. One, smaller N, closer, strong attraction. And in a shell, S lower than P, lower than D. Pretty straightforward. Now, often you'll see this kind of static. But please remember that this will depend on the number of electrons you have in an atom as well as the number of protons you have in an atom. Now there are exceptions. Um, some elements do not follow that order of filling exactly. Sometimes for like um, silver, it will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5s1, 4d, 10. And so the, what we would have thought would be in the, in the s is actually in the d to fill out that d subshell. And so I mentioned that the energy levels change. And so on the left, what you see is the energy levels um, for the different elements. And it was based on a fairly good calculation. And so notice that as you go to larger atomic number, more protons in the nucleus, that 1s orbital actually goes down. And again, the energy on the left is an absolute scale. And so more protons in the nucleus corresponds to a lower, more stable 1s orbital. Notice that we are following Pauli exclusion principle, and so we have a maximum of two electrons per orbital. An arrow up and arrow down correspond to m sub s plus a half and m sub s minus a half. Notice we're following Hund's rule, and so electrons get their own, own orbital as long as possible when the orbitals are of the same energy. And so again, look at here we have carbon, so those two electrons, same orbital, three carbon, three um, electrons, same orbital, same orbitals as long as possible. Again, Hund's rule. And so if we go through, say, the first uh, 10 elements or so, and so for hydrogen, that one on the periodic table corresponds to atomic number, 
one, and so we have one proton, one electron in an atom of hydrogen, and so that electron just goes to the 1s orbital. Now we don't know if m sub s is plus a half or minus a half for the electron, it doesn't really matter. Now if we write down the electron configuration for hydrogen, it'd just be 1s1, where the one in front corresponds to n, s means l equals zero, and then superscript one means there's one electron in that subshell. Now, hydrogen atoms are paramagnetic, meaning that there's an unpaired electron. And so if you have any unpaired electrons, it's going to be paramagnetic. It's going to be attracted to a magnetic field. Uh, hydrogen atoms are paramagnetic. Hydrogen molecules would actually be diamagnetic. Now, if we go to helium, helium at atomic number two, two protons, two electrons. And so now we have two electrons in the 1s. Again, according to Pauli exclusion principle, you can have a maximum of two electrons per orbital, one with m sub s plus a half, one with m sub s minus a half. And again, the arrows are there to denote that one is m sub s plus a half and one is m sub s minus a half. Now helium has a full shell. The 1s orbital is shell, the first, sorry, the first shell is full, and helium is, is very stable. There are no known compounds with helium. Now all the electrons are paired, and so that means helium atoms are diamagnetic, and so it's going to be actually be repulsed by a magnetic field. If we go to element three, that's lithium, and so we have three electrons, and again, all we're doing is we're filling the electrons starting with the lowest energy first, maximum two electrons per orbital, and following this Hund's rule. And so for lithium, we have electron configuration of 1s2, 2s1. Now lithium atoms are paramagnetic because we have an unpaired electron. If we go to beryllium, now we have four electrons, and so electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. Um, beryllium atoms are diamagnetic, so all the electrons are paired, and so beryllium atoms should be repulsed by a magnetic field. Element number five is boron, and so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. We have an unpaired electron, and so that means boron atoms should be paramagnetic. Now once we go to carbon, we have one more electron, and we're going to put that electron in its own orbital. And so again, Hund's rule says that when the orbitals have the same energy, and as much as possible, put the electrons in their own orbital. That's Hund's rule. And so electron configuration for carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. And so you should remember that the numbers in front correspond to n. And so when I say 2s2, that 2 in front is uh, n equals 2. S again is, corresponds to l equals 0. P corresponds to l equals 1. D corresponds to l equals 2. And F corresponds to l equals 3. The superscripts indicate the number of electrons in that subshell. And so we have a two electrons in the 1s, two electrons in the 2s, and two in the 2p. Now in the little video on the upper right hand corner, you know, it's the 1s orbital, the 2s orbital, a 2p, another 2p, and a third 2p. And so all the electron orbitals are actually stacked right on top of the nucleus. And so now if we go to nitrogen element number seven, again, we're going to give each electron their own orbital as much as we can. Um, following Hund's rule, and so now we have three unpaired electrons. And so we should expect that nitrogen is more paramagnetic than carbon. The more unpaired electrons, the more paramagnetic. And so nitrogen atoms should be more paramagnetic than carbon atoms. Nitrogen molecules are diamagnetic. It's also kind of interesting, having a half-field subshell is a little extra stable. And so nitrogen atoms are a little bit more stable than we would actually expect. And when we start talking about peric trends, we'll see that nitrogen often doesn't follow the peric trends. It's because it's a little bit extra stable because that half-field subshell. And so for oxygen, now we have to pair um, two electrons up. And so I want us to, to us to 2p4. And so oxygen atoms should be paramagnetic. Fluorine, again, we had an electron. Um, we have a, one unpaired electron. So again, fluorine atoms should be paramagnetic. Electron configuration was 2, 2s2, 2p5. And then we end with neon. And so with neon, it's again a noble gas. 
It has full subshells. It's very stable. There are no known compounds with neon. Now for argon, krypton, and xenon, there actually are some known compounds, even though they're, they're fairly non-reactive. So noble gases are fairly non-reactive, but for larger noble gases, you actually do see some compounds. Now it's kind of in interesting, you know, the noble gases are, are fairly stable, and so atoms tend to want to gain, lose, or share electrons to actually get noble gas configuration because it is so much more stable. Now looking at the Bragg table, you know, we can think about what is the last orbital that was actually occupied. And so we have two columns on the left. That's where the S orbitals are populated. In the middle, we got the 10 columns. That's where the D orbitals are get occupied. On the right, we have those six columns. That's where the P orbitals get occupied. And on the bottom for lanthanides and arachnides, we have 14 columns. That's where the F orbitals actually get occupied. And so it's kind of cool. We can actually match the order of filling to the product table. And so the order, typical order of filling goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6. And so using the product table, you should be able to determine the, the electron configuration for any element. And again, there are exceptions to this order of filling. You know, those are in the red. And so a question you could see would be, what is electron configuration for sodium? Now, to answer this question, you know, you're always given a product table, but there's no names, and so you need to know that sodium is Na. And so I want you to be able to memorize the names and symbols for the first 36 elements. You know, product table is not any help to you if you don't know that sodium is Na. And so knowing that sodium is Na, then we can just do the order of filling. It's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then 3s1. We can also simplify it by using the noble gas. And so neon is the last noble gas before sodium. And so we could say neon and then 3s1. And so going 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, or neon 3s1, those are completely equivalent. You could also be asked, is sodium paramagnetic or diamagnetic? Well, you have a one electron in that s orbital, and so that's going to be unpaired. And so it has to be paramagnetic. And so all alkaline metal atoms are paramagnetic. And so alkaline metal uh, elements are that first column. Now another important part about electron configurations is valence electrons versus core electrons. Now valence electrons means the outer shell electrons. And so again, remember that shells denoted by N. And so outer means basically biggest N. And so here we have magnesium and the electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. And so outer shell would be that third shell. And so you'd have two Venn's electrons for magnesium. Now the core electrons are all the rest. And so an electron is either part of the valence shell or part of the core shell. It cannot be both. It has to be one or the other. And so magnesium has two valence electrons and 10 core electrons. If we look at chlorine, it's got seven valence electrons and 10 core electrons. If we look at calcium, now notice for calcium, you got two electrons in that 4s. And so the outer shell, the biggest N would be the fourth. That would be the fourth shell. And so you have two electrons in the fourth shell. And so you have two valence electrons and then all the rest are core. And so there's a total of 20 electrons. So 20 minus two gives you 18. And so that gives you 18 core electrons. And so even though the th third shell is not full, notice you don't have the 3D orbitals filled, the third shell is still part of the core. Valence electrons are outer shell electrons. Um, the reason that valence electron is important is because they dominate the chemical behavior. But please remember strictly that valence electrons are outer shell electrons. And so DNF electrons are never valence electrons because they are never in the outer shell. And again, re please remember an electron is either a valence electron or a core electron. It has to be one or the other. It cannot be both. 
And remember that core electrons do not always correspond to full shell or noble gas configuration. The concept of core versus valence is most important for the color regions, what's referred to as the S block and the P block. The transition metals behave a little bit differently, and so the concept of valence and core is, is not really as important for the transition metals, even though you can still use it for the transition metals. Now, it'll become very important when we start talking about Lewis diagrams. You have to remember that the, the column number, excluding the transition metals, is equal to the number of valence electrons. And so the far left column, the alkaline metals, have one valence electron. The second column, the alkaline earths, have two valence electrons, then three, four, five, six. And the noble gases actually have eight valence electrons. And so again, please remember the number of valence electrons is equal to the column number excluding the transition metals. Uh, germanium has four valence electrons. And so again, we're looking at our shell, which would be the fourth shell here. And so we have four electrons in the Bennett shell. All the rest are going to be in core. And again, D and F are never Bennett's electrons. Now, it's also kind of interesting. I should have pointed out that all elements in the column have the same, same Bennett's electron configuration. Right? So I mentioned that the member of Bennett's electrons is equal to the column number. And so that tells you that all elements in the column have the same valence electron configuration. And so what that leads to is that elements in the column tend to have similar, similar chemical properties. Okay, So all elements in the column have the same valence electron configuration. And so all, so all elements in the column tend to react in similar ways. And so we break out the periodic table into groups. And so the column on the far left is alkaline metals. The second column is alkaline earths. Uh, the column on the far right is normal gases. Then you have the halogens, and then you have the calcogens. In the middle, you have the transition metals, and then you have the lanthanides and actinides. And so I expect you to know the names and the valence electron configurations of the different groups. Um, please remember, hydrogen is not a member of any group. Hydrogen is a little bit different. Often it's put in above the alkali metals, but it is not an alkali metal. Sometimes you also see hydrogen put in above fluorine because sometimes it can form a minus one charge. But hydrogen is a non-metal, but is not a member of any group. And so I hope that was helpful.